You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the OptionsInsider.com and co-hosts Alex the Viceroy Jacobson from Options Express, Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionFit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Don't spend time worrying about your broker at Options Express by Charles Schwab. Security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit www.optionsexpress.com to open your free account. Options Express by Charles Schwab is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Option Block. We are, of course, your bi-weekly source for all things options-related my name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as from the ever expanding, ever exciting, ever insightful, ever compelling Options Insider Radio Network. I'm running out of adjectives to describe the growth of the network, but it is growing like a weed. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, make sure you check out the latest editions, including Options Playbook Radio and everyone's new favorite trading tech talk. That, of course, is the program where we break down all of the hardcore stuff going on behind the scenes that take your trades from the click of the mouse to a clearinghouse and back again. And if you're up in arms about HFT, Flash Boys, Dark Pools, Co-Location, all that stuff, Latency, The Race to Zero, that is the show for you. Check it out. Trading Tech Talk. I think you're going to like it. Who knows? Maybe you'll be educated and perhaps outraged at the same time, which means it's a fun program. And while you're checking those new shows out, make sure you download our brand spanking new mobile app available for iOS, Android, and even for the handful of you who want it, the Amazon <laughs> Kindle Fire version. You can instantly stream all 300 plus episodes of this fine program, as well as every other program on the network. Download them for offline listening on the subway, on the plane, wherever you like to listen to our fine programs. And of course, you can hit that at symbol, that email button, Instantly, whenever you have questions, comments, feedback, insight, you don't like something Andrew just said, let him know. Hit that app button, bam, fire it off, and we'll, of course, feature it on the program. If it doesn't have any, any curse words, you may have to excise those because it is a show for families, of course. All right. And speaking of my fellow co-hosts here on the old all-star panel, I am joined by the usual cast of characters, minus one, who's having some dental work done as we speak. And if you know anything about radio listeners, dental work and the radio don't necessarily go hand in hand. It's kind of like nuts and gum, two great tastes that don't exactly go well together. So we're down a man, but none the worse for wear on the program. Starting off beaming in from the great state of Maine, none other than the Rock Lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com. Mr. G, welcome back to the program, sir. Thank you. The lobster is in the house or in the pot, I guess, as, as it were. You ready to do double the talking to take the place of Uncle Mike Tussaw today? Um, well, um, I, I, I can talk Illinois-esque if, if necessary. <laughs> Illinois, Illinois-y. Because you know that guy talks the whole show. You can't shut him up. So you really have to do double duty today, Andrew, to fill in for him. <laughs> and he just keeps talking about Apple, which was up again today. Probably, I think that's a short-term high today. Pretty easy story to tell when it's just up, up, and away all day, pretty much. 
I, that's what he, I think, strives for. Just buy stocks that just go up, and then he doesn't have to really worry about them too much. <laughs> you know, there are worse plans that I've heard here in the old business. Speaking of the business, we are also joined by a man who's been in all aspects. He's seen it all and done it all, listeners. None other than the Viceroy himself, Mr. Alex Jacobson, holding down the educational hot seat over there at Options Express by Charles Schwab. Mr. Jacobson, welcome back to the program, sir. Good to be here today, Mark. And I'm, I'm writing down that last piece of wisdom just by stocks that go up. Yeah. Jeez, I, I, I haven't figured that out in all these years. That's <laughs> amazing. But if kudos to you. I listened to the uh, Tony Saliba interview uh, over the weekend. And uh, again, probably one of the three to five most famous, most successful market makers in the formative days of the SIBO. I, I know wherever I cut that number off, uh, I, I will get an angry email, by the way, generally from Tony, but but this time I'm including him in it. But, but uh, truly one of the great traders, truly uh, for many years, the, the, the face of the SIBO, especially after the 87 crash, uh, somewhat of a controversial character, but just a terrific guy. And interesting to hear how his current company transacts with almost one out of every three option contracts that that that, that trades today. So, again, uh, as an avid listener, I, I would encourage everybody to, to go back and listen to last week's interview with Tony. Um, I very much grew up in this business uh, at the same time Tony did. And, and there's some great Tony stories that I've always – uh, wanted to tell on the air. Uh, uh, unfortunately, when you get these terrific people on, uh, some of the most colorful points of their past, <laughs> they don't want to seem to talk about. So one day we we all need to get a couple cocktails and we'll do stories of some of these great market makers uh, that uh, Options Express will find a new host for the show. <laughs> <after> <laughs> That'll be your sign-off episode, Alex. <laughs> yeah, that's... That's the that's the one after you've taken the pay package and haven't told anybody to to they, if they need to host the show. I'll do the 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 stories of the guys on the floor, the Salibas, the Dr. J's, the the Blair Halls, the you know, I could go down the list. But Tony, as pointed out in the first Market Wizards, uh one of the truly great traders, one of the truly great ambassadors, traveled the world. Uh he and I went to Asia uh, to uh, promote the SIBO, but um, the you know people always ask the question who created the backspreads and and it, it actually is guys like Tony that did some of that first trading. It's it, sometimes hard to pin down to the person, but a, an incredible trading story and a story of somebody from really humble beginnings uh, who became very very successful. And, and one of the reasons I like to tell those stories is, you know, every day there's a piece of mail from some newbie who says, I'm starting with $1,000 or I'm starting with $2,000. Do I really have a chance? And the answer is, yeah, most of these guys started with 1000 or or, or 2000 and now are worth, I mean, I, I mean this literally hundreds of millions of dollars. So great interview. Thank you, Alex. I always love doing those because I know at least I'll have an audience of one, Alex, and I know you'll tune in for all of those sessions we do there. But we had a great time recording all of those down at the big OIC conference a few years ago, a few years ago, a few weeks ago. And there's a lot more coming down the pike, listeners. We just didn't want to overwhelm you guys with content. In fact, my conversation with Tony was so epic and so wide ranging that we had to cut it into two parts. And I've known Tony for years, uh, not as long as you have, Alex, but certainly since the early days of Insider. And it's, I'm surprised it's taken as long as it has to finally get him uh, on the network. But it was some interesting stuff going on there, going back to his early days as a market maker, as well as, you're right, what they're doing over there at Liquid Point. And if you just look at the number of orders they touch uh, on a given day, that's some serious volume going on over there behind the scenes. I think uh, they said if you look at everything they touch uh, across the industry, they'd be somewhere around the number seven options exchange total. Again, they're not transacting all of that, but still uh, gives you some idea of how much volume is going up behind the scenes on some of these services uh, like Liquid Point. Check it out. That's in our Options Insider radio feed. That's, of course, our flagship show, our interview program. You can also find it in our Options Insider radio network main feed. That's where all of our shows go, as well as our 
conferences and special events feed. So three different places for you to find that conversation. And speaking of conversations, it's time for us to get rolling with this one because it's time for the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, and welcome to the trading block. And it was another interesting one on the old street today. Not a rip roarer in any one direction, but a decent rally going on across the broad indices. The S&P is up nearly half a percentage point, or about seven handles and change, to 1885. The Dow up fractionally on the day to 16,511. Uh, the Q's up a little bit stronger, up about three quarters of a percentage point. Seeing uh, some interesting moves out in NASDAQ yet again today in the VIX cash. Uh, coming off a little bit, coming off about a tenth of a point to hover in that low 12 handle region yet again, closing today at 12.33. As Mr. Andrew alluded to, Uncle Mike's favorite holding, he couldn't be here today, so we'll do it for him. His, his favorite holding up about one and a quarter percent or about seven handles to 605. Now he was uh, watching, I know very diligently whether they would break that 600 handle and sustain it. Well, they certainly did so today, closing well above the 600 handle. So now I'm assuming the sky is the limit with all of Uncle Mike's Apple holdings. I'm just going to let him fly high, just have a long put and long stock, and see uh, where he cashes out this time. Maybe they'll go back and challenge that 700 level again where he very, very famously got out or close to it on the last big Apple rally. Aside from Apple, Senior G, Senior Rock Lobster, what caught the eye of you and indeed your clients and mentees over there at Option Pit in today's activity? Well, you know, it, it's an interesting day as far as, you know, on a slow news day, what really counts for a rally? Uh, and, you know, I think the biggest news is a VIX, uh, VIX cash after a weekend wasn't all there just wasn't a lot of buy i mean we're trading 1233 getting close to the 11 handle again um maybe we'll get that low of the year for volatility you know i just think there wasn't great reasons for stocks to rally mostly it feels like kind of a dead cap bounce for most of the names like the netflix priceline google um although i think google's not quite in that category but a lot of names just sort of bouncing around um not a lot of strength um, from any real one particular area, except, you know, mostly just like I said, that momentum technology group seemed to do okay. Yeah, a little bit of lift in the financials. Uh, but the vol products uh, and vol future premium took another hit today. So, you know, every day nothing really happens. It really puts a lot of pressure on uh, those products. So, you know, we're seeing it here even after hours now, the, you know, VXX is trading below 36. So there's still pretty good pressure on the vol complex overall. And nobody wants to, we're at this level. I think every day we stay um, probably above 18, uh, let's say 1875. Uh, we closed above 1885 today in the SPX. That's another day people don't worry about us crashing. Um, you know, We've got bonds kind of rallying, but only because rates are going to stay low for a while because the growth is kind of slow. So, again, it's not enough to give us those crazy rallies we had in uh, 2013, uh, but it's enough to, you know, kind of make the market plot along and, and have volatility it just kind of go nowhere. And everybody's kind of been head faked around by the vol we've had, you know, at least in 2014. You know, it starts to pop for about five seconds, and then the air gets right out of the balloon again. And I think we're just seeing more of the same of that um, lately. You know, we touch on this a lot, obviously, on our Volatility Views program. I know you couldn't join us uh, this past week, Andrew. We had an interesting discussion about all that kind of stuff. And in particular, that persistent drumbeat we're seeing out in the broad financial media about how the long-term average of the VIX is 20. So this thing is mean reverting. It's got to revert back, and it's got to do it aggressively. Uh, so load up now. A lot of that being driven by the SIBO itself, who keeps propagating that long-term average number of 20 out there. Uh, I think partly to, to keep the the investor sentiment that this thing has to move and maybe there's a move coming uh, down the road. But I think like a lot of our guests on that show have said, and we've said many times on that show as well, it is quite possible just to languish here for an extended period of time. You know, people have this, 
I think, mistaken impression that because volatility is mean reverting, it's got to do it now. It's got to do it aggressively. And so you better get in on your VIX upside now. Uh, whereas we could easily languish in this. I hate to even call it a malaise. Just to me, this is, this is kind of normal territory for VIX around here. Uh, yep. So I, I don't buy into this long-term 20 thump. Maybe call me old school SPX or whatever the case may be. But uh, this to me is, is normal. <laughs> so uh, we could easily be around here for a long time. And it seems like the persistent drumbeat seems to be, no, no, it's got to go up. It's got to go up and it's got to go up now. A lot of the paper we're seeing starting to reflect that VIX getting even more call heavy than it ever has been. Of course, part of that could also be due to the fact that we're so low in the strike spectrum. There just aren't many put strikes left to choose from. So that could also, <laughs> some of the mechanics could be playing into that number as well. But still, this persistent drumbeat of it's got to revert and it's got to revert back to the 20 handle uh, is starting to bother me because it, we could easily be here for quite some time. And listeners, if you're one of those people out, and out right now who's running out to gobble up BXX because it's going to revert, I think you may be regretting that decision in a month or two from now. Yeah, you're seeing, uh, you know, it's a blog that I'm going to write today. Is you're starting to see a little stretch on the short-term volatility getting real low and the longer-term volatility starting to head upward, uh, you know, the curb kind of steepening a little bit as we kind of stay down here. So it's just people buying volatility long-term are going to pay big, big, do <laughs> big dollars for it uh, relative. So, you know, it, 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 I mean, when we were in the SPX, I think 13 volatility used to be a great sale. Um, I think long-term capital management before they blew out sold, you know, a couple hundred million vague at 13. <laughs> yeah, ask them how, how quickly <laughs> volatility mean reverts. Exactly. Um, so, you know, that was just a small little bond scare with the emerging markets back then that everybody ran for the hills. But it's tough when, you're, uh, it's tough when you have all those things sort of going wrong at the same time. It's not, not so much fun. Um, and But that's where we are. Like, we could... The problem with VIX is it doesn't get too far below 20, um, but when it goes above 20, it goes above a long way. So it tends to kind of skew the result a little bit, uh, you know, to that uh, upside. But we could sit down here for quite a while, um, and this is how volatility lows are made. I think this is what uh, Alex and I thought would happen this year. We thought it would happen sooner. Uh, because of sort of all the market giddiness and euphoria and stuff like that. But, you know, we had a couple of monkey wrenches in it. But is this is this bullish overall when Vol stays cheap like this? You know, people start selling puts and people sell puts because they don't think the market's going to go down. And that, that dampens volatility down a bunch, gets people, um, you know, and at, at some point, you know, more and more people jump on that bandwagon and it will get ugly one day. Um, but for right now, I don't think we're, uh, we're not quite there yet. Mr. Alex, what caught your eye in today's activity over there in the land known as OX by Charles Schwab? Well, it's, it's, it's going to sound pretty ordinary, but, uh, today was Apple, AT&T, DirecTV. Um, when I surveyed the desk, I mean, Facebook has become, uh, the new kind of Lulu here, I know I keep saying that, and that's uh, that's keeping the desk busy. But today was one of those all Apple days. Uh, SPX, SPY, and VIX volume, uh, once again, were real quiet. Um, and that seems to be a trend lately. We, we either, you know, get half of a typical or three or four times the typical. So um, today was just a quiet day. And... You know, the, the the news was dominated today. I mean, it was the takeover stories were uh, really what dominated the news. But the takeover stories were AT&T Direct and, and, and the AstraZeneca Pfizer, which have been around for a while and aren't really uh, any, you know, shock to anyone. I mean, the AT&T Direct deal has probably been, uh, if not the worst kept secret on the street, it, it's been uh, out there for a while. So... So, you know, there was some volume in it. Uh, the other thing the desk said they saw today is, you know, who else looks like. And and that sounds like a kind of a strange thing to say, but it, it, it's it's kind of raising the question, if Pfizer doesn't get AstraZeneca, you know, who else has that appearance? Who else might they go after? Uh, both of these deals, the, the AT&T direct TV deal is, is really about cash flow. 
and it's really about maintaining the dividend and and NFL rights and there's 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 a lot of undercurrents to this. Um, I want to add a little bit onto what Andrew said about volatility and 12 being the, the new norm. You know, I grew up in an environment where it was seven eight, and uh, I'm not surprised. As much as six months ago, I would have thought three and a half ten year and a six. 16, 17 VIX, um, you know, we're seeing the 10 year potentially trade back towards the, towards the two number. And there are a lot of people on the street now that have just gotten decimated because they were short bonds. Um, I think that could be possible with VIX. I think we go into a quiet summer and the market doesn't get hit. Uh, we could see VIX trading in single digits. I mean, it, you know, and, Drew will tell you, and, and Mark, you can talk about this, you know, mean reversion trading and waiting for it to happen. There are a lot of people go out of business waiting for the, the mean reversion trade to work. And, and uh, uh, you know, vol could get lower. We could go to systemic vol. And, and you know, every time, I mean, I've been in the option markets a long time, and I got a lot of gray hair, and I know I say that every second show. Every time somebody tells me they fit figured out implied vol and they've really got it within a month or two, uh, they get a career change. So uh, we could see things go a lot lower in terms of both vol and, and rates here. Yeah. My nightmare scenario for a lot of the listeners of this show would be, they look at the VIX. They think it's really low. They start buying into this mantra that the long-term average of the VIX is 20 and that volatility is aggressively mean reverting. So they have to get in now. And then of course they pile in, to one of these products that we've frequently maligned on the show, like VXX. And like Andrew just mentioned, they're starting to bid up the far end of that futures term structure so that roll yield is getting even more in your face on a product like that. And they're going to buy and hold that for the next month or two. And then they're going to be surprised at why, why did that not perform for them. So listeners, if you're considering doing that now, let me please just warn you off of that. Do not take that approach. Unless you expect VIX to pop tomorrow or in the next couple of days. Other than that, even that couple of days is too long of a holding period for VXX. One one day in and out, that's it. So if you're trading BXX, maybe start thinking about some of the other strategies we've illuminated on this show many times in the past. Speaking of illuminating some strategies or perhaps lack thereof, it's time for us to move on into our next segment, The Odd Block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody, that funky tune means it's time once again for the old odd block, this is, of course, the portion of the show where we tell you what we've been watching today, what's caught our eye from an unusual activity in the options market perspective. Going to kick things off with a, an odd block, typical type of name. This is Onkathrion Inc. I'm hoping I pronounced that right. Ticker symbol O-N-T-Y. Good old auntie. Closing today, $2.80, up about $0.11 cents and change. Uh, this is indeed one of our sub-$3 biotechs that we love to profile here on the show because they are so popular with the unusual activity traders. This is a name that does about 500 contracts a day, lighten up the tape to the tune of a whopping 1300 so about almost 2.5x on today's ADV. And what we saw in particular, surprise, surprise, was some upside call buyers in a small, cheapy biotech to the tune of when we profiled it, about 600 of the DEES, looking a little bit farther out this time, the DEES 3s uh, going up 600 times for prices around 50 to 55 cents, all going up in small blocks, most of them lifting, lifting the offer, not surprising because this is a relatively illiquid name. Uh, they've lifted the offer 50 cents, then chased some more, got 55s after that. Looks like an opening buy because there isn't a heck of a lot of open interest on that strike. We also did see about 300 of the Dece 4s uh, going up as well. That went up after we profiled the Dece 3 action. So that went up 350 times for a total of about 1,000 contracts between the two trades. Senior Giovinazzi, do you feel this is related? This is perhaps legging into an indecisive Tucson-esque stupid? <laughs> that would just be, 
<laughs> the two saw stupid broke me up there for a second. <laughs> you know, we do have a history when one of the co-hosts is not on the show, we bag on them. Just a just a little bit. Alex, you you cannot believe the things we said about you when you were gone weren't here last week. <laughs> yes, don't go back and listen to the shows from last week, Alex. Yes, whatever you do, Alex, don't listen. Anyway, um, there's two guys in San Francisco that look like Gene Hackman in the conversation who listen to every minute of every show. And then I get uh, uh, lengthy emails threatening my life. Um, so it's become a way of life. I, I, don't, I don't envy those fellows, their position. <laughs> that, is, that is funny, actually. Oh, 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 that's the... Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot that you're compliance guys. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Uh, anyway, ONTY, I'm going to say... Um, I don't know if they're really related. Um, one looks kind of buy ratty, the other one looks like a little more speculative purchase. Um, uh, the threes look like just kind of a buyer trying to step up and buy some contracts. I don't think anything super, except that you know it's it's a name with you know way too many consonants in it. It's a biotech, and um, they're in the business of biotechnology. It's one of my favorites. Uh, they don't really make any money. They don't have a product yet, but they're in the business of, you know. And then all of a sudden, the stock goes to 40 bucks, and that's kind of what this trade feels like. It's a, Somebody's just trying to go for the lotto ticket on a name that has a promising therapy, which, of course, for all the rest of us who might get cancer, we hope that they cure everything. Yes, these names are in the business of generating upside call paper, pretty much. <laughs> That's their <laughs> <Exactly>. business. <laughs> I think they're all uh, secretly funded by the exchanges just to, just to keep them in business. Just to keep upside calls going. <laughs> um, so, yes, uh, you know, not, uh, but always, always like to see another biotech name. Uh, I used to, I've traded a lot of these things over the years, and they are fun. Um, this one looks a lot like most of them, where it's just kind of trying to get it going here, and we'll. We'll see what happens. Not very expensive call. So my guess would be probably not any kind of uh, like an FDA news or anything out like that between now and December, which is a pretty long time for a biotech company not to have any activity. Yeah, that's the one thing that struck me the most about this paper is usually you see it's got to happen right now. It's got to go up right now because the FDA is coming out tomorrow. You don't usually see someone lining up for the end of the year. Yeah. So in, interesting in that respect. So, you know, you kind of make a note of it and see what happens. Uh, but see if maybe a status changes. Uh, that's that's possible. So, But uh, for right now, I mean, not a heck of a lot going on in that name. I guess we can label that surprisingly patient upside call paper. In the, in the, Surprising, in the surprisingly patient. Uh, it did get an earnings boost to just about $4. Uh you know, I don't see what, you know, they lost a penny less than everybody thought. Um, but the volatility has stayed at 86 for six straight months. That'll just give you an idea of how not very active this particular name is and how little they have on the FDA horizon, at least until maybe this call buyer uh, figures it out. Or indeed, until the filing that he knows about and no one else does becomes official. There we go. Yes. <laughs> All right. Next up on the old odd block. We have another newcomer. If $3 or so was a little bit too cheap, but you don't want to go too crazy, too far up the food chain, we got another name for you. This is Gas Star Exploration Inc., ticker symbol GST, closing today $7.34, up about $0.41 cents or about 6% of the day, so a good day for the folks out there in GST. And what we saw going up out here was was an interesting one. We don't really see pretty much any of these going up that I can recall in the old odd block. Uh, we saw a, a two-sided spread. Looks like mostly closing on both sides. Uh, started off with about 4,280 of the June 5 calls going up, being purchased for about prices ranging from 240 to 255. And then we saw at the time you profiled it, 3,658 and a total of 5,585 of the June seven half puts going up for 50 to 60 cents as well. And that's right, I said the five calls and the seven and a half puts both closing. So it looks like we're seeing someone closing out uh, what amounts to essentially a gut strangle. You don't see that uh, too often, listeners. Usually, if you're familiar with strangles, you know uh, the calls are the out of the money portion and the puts are the out of the money portion. Uh, instead, this guy flipping the script and doing the in the money on both, which translates into a pricier trade, but also what's known popularly 
as a guts strangle. And also we saw about a thousand of the June seven half calls also going up. All of this on pretty much substantial open interest, eight thousand of the June fives, two thousand of the June seven halves, and about six thousand of the June seven half puts. So looks like closing paper all around. Senior Rock Lobster, is that your take as well? Is this someone who had a size gut strangle on and taking it off here? I can only assume that's what it is. It's just it was a real small paper to close. I mean, like, now I'm not going to say real small. But it was like hundreds and 200 lots. Uh, but it, it certainly felt like that way. Like, where was short the June seven and a half puts? Uh, it felt like they are closing today. You know, you got the big rally to the strike. Um, the stock was five bucks, you know, a couple months ago. So it just feels like that. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're seeing all the, a lot of buying in the June 5. So it, it, it's certainly feeling like a gut strangle. I mean, you know, they probably did okay on the thing. I mean, they're buying it back for maybe three bucks, uh, you know, and if the stock was down there, they probably sold it maybe for four. I don't, you know, it could, it could have worked out. Um, but that's certainly the way the trade looks like it's working right now. But whatever this gas star is, is, uh, been on a little bit of a tear lately, so I, I can see why they're they're closing it now because the you sell it got strangle and now you're at the seven and a half strike, so you're some of their protection might be going away. Um, so that that could be part of the issue here. Their uh, short put is getting uh, less and less short by the day as the stock keeps going up. So they they might need a way to to fix this situation. They got to do something. Uh, Unless the thing trades eight, eight and a half all, and then it becomes a mess. Looks like he had something going on the seven half call strike as well. It could be closing that out. It could be adding some more. Maybe he's uh, he's rolling on up and out. Either way, an interesting trade. I just like saying gut strangle on the show. We don't get a chance to say that as often as perhaps we should. The this is not a lot of these going up these days. So whenever we see them going up for any particular size, listeners, uh, chances are we're going to talk about them here on the old show. All right, next up. It's a name we talked about not too long ago, listeners. You may remember back on our May 15th show when we profiled some uh, upside call activity here in Chemtura, ticker symbol CHMT. At the time, we looked at the June 25s and someone coming in to gobble these guys up. Well, it looks like they were, they were pretty much on the right side of that trade uh, the stock has pretty much gone up since that point. We're looking here today, Chemtura closing up right around, hovering near that strike, up about 25 cents today to 24.74, uh, just a quarter away from that 25 strike. And so not surprisingly, that buying activity we saw back on May 15th, we're seeing some closing coming in today to the tune of 2,500 contracts going up and pretty much one block trader coming in, blasting them out. Hitting the bid against 14,000 open interest. He sold them out for 70 cents at the time. Looks like, again, this guy just taking some of his money, some of his profits off the table against the buying activity we profiled on the show last month. Senior Lobster, is that your take as well, sir? I, I concur. I think he's just, he made, uh, basically made a double on the calls, and uh, the stock hasn't done a whole bunch since. Uh, last week and you know his calls are kind of melting away and he's like I better, I better take the money while I can which sometimes you don't have the chance anymore because the stock pulls back and your long calls and then the whole thing just kind of falls apart so I think it's just part of that 14,000 contract open interest just hitting the highway sayonara baby yeah I bet you he's wishing he hit a few more because they're at 70 going out right now so they are melting of course his paper contributing uh, to that erosion of premium out there, but perhaps they'll get the rest off. Stay tuned for that, listeners. Uh, keep an eye on that. If you're trading that name, someone may be coming in to blast out the rest of that open interest sometime soon. All right, moving on to our final name here in the old odd block today. This is a name we talked about frequently on the show. It has been a little bit since we've checked back in with it. This is the iShares Brazil Index ETF. Ticker symbol EWZ, closing today, $48.86. Uh, this is the name that does, oh, about 100,000 contracts a day. So from an odd block perspective, it is blowing the doors off pretty much all the other names that we talk about, doing about that same level today. So it wasn't so much the size of the paper uh, that we saw going up today as it was what was actually going up 
uh, that caught our interest. In particular, we've ha highlighted a few call rolls on the odd block recently. This is another one of those. But instead of up and out, looks like it's just out to the tune of the July, October 50 call spread we saw going up about 17,000 times, 16,800 to be precise, uh, to the tune of a dollar 22 here on the day. And again, the open interest in July, about 12,000 and 50,000 in the October, went up in two blocks, as you might imagine, uh, marked as spread as we typically see with this kind of stuff. Again, looks like opening paper in October, closing in July. Someone taking his position here on the Brazil index and saying, I still like it. I still like this level. Just give me a little bit more time. So rolling on out to October, not even going up a little bit, staying right on that 50 handle. Senior Rock Lobster, take us home. What's your take on this relatively standard, if sizable, call roll here in EWZ? Yeah, I, I think they're just trying to get a It feels like they want to get a little long. Uh, maybe the EWZ has a hard time really getting through 50 by the middle of summer. Uh, and they want to sort of pick up uh, again. But a little long time spread like this is, to me, just kind of a way to get long without having to spend a lot of money to do it. Uh, and that's that's what they're... I think that's what the trader wants. It looks like opening, opening. It would be a strange to buy that spread to close it back as we're nearing the strike. So I don't know exactly if they, you know, if it was a sell to close, it's like, when do they do it? Um, so it, that doesn't really make any sense to me. So it's it's more just a good old fashioned, we'll get a little long, we'll collect a little decay, and we'll see if this Brazilian index can really go up another, you know, two, three percent. Indeed. All right, listeners, that is going to do it. If you'd like to play along on the home game, a lot of great ways for you to do that. You can, of course, surf on over to the optionsinsider.com. Click on the unusual activity tab there. See all the alerts we didn't have time to get to on the show today, as well as much more detail on these particular alerts, any updates that may have occurred throughout the day, and a lot of other interesting stuff while you're over there. Meanwhile, we're going to keep on rolling with the program right on into our next segment, The Express Block. The Express Block. Brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade where and when you want for every level of trading. From advanced charting, free daily trading ideas, and free educational resources. Options Express by Charles Schwab is the online broker for all traders. Best of all, Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade stocks, options, and futures all in a single account. On powerful yet easy-use trading platforms including mobile devices. Visit OptionsExpress.com for your free account. Options Express by Charles Schwab is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Express Block. This is, of course, the portion of the show where the Viceroy takes us on a behind-the-scenes VIP tour into the land known as Options Express by Charles Schwab. And this has actually been an interesting time to see what's been going on out there because there have been quite a few headlines uh, coming out of you guys over there at Schwab of late. One in particular caught my eye, Alex, and I think this is really interesting stuff, definitely worthy uh, of discussing here on the program. Of course, a lot of our listeners may remember a few months back when the founder of Charles Schwab jumped into the post-Flash Boys discussion calling HFT and all that activity a cancer on the markets and saying it was impacting the retail customer in a negative sense. A lot of people thought those comments were very interesting. Some people in the industry thought, rightfully so, a lot of them raised this issue that the firm is also still collecting payment at the same time from a lot of these firms. Why don't they make that a little bit more transparent? Well, the CEO of Schwab today, Walt Bettinger, coming out and saying exactly that. And I, I love this. I wish more brokerage CEOs would come out and say things like this. He actually is calling for more regulation on payment in the option space, which in the equity space, which is just fantastic to hear. He said, one idea for the regulators to consider is maybe a requirement that we put on a trade confirmation the actual amount of order flow payment we receive, and also who we receive it from. And this is what a lot of critics of payment have always said for years. It's fine if you do it. Let's just have some transparency behind it. And now here's a CEO of one of the largest brokerage firms in the country essentially saying to the regulators, please make us do this. And this to me, I hope this happens. I hope Schwab really takes the lead on this because I would love to see every trade ticket. Here's exactly how much payment we collected from this. Here's who paid it to us. Uh, and that would be fantastic. You can outline, here's what we use some of that payment for. Here's maybe what your commission would have been without the payment, et cetera, et cetera. You can really make it all 
completely transparent to the end user. So they then have a clear and open choice. Here's where I want to go. Here's where I want to execute. Here's exactly how much that execution cost me. Here's where that decision came from. I think this is fantastic. Alex, are you as excited about this as I am? Yeah, I, I, I think transparency is everything. And I think part of what the industry is going through now and part of what the industry went through in 2000 with the real establishment of electronic trading uh, was the beginning of the transparency that I think a customer is entitled to. And I'm even going to go out on the limb and, and uh, say having worked at two exchanges – and, and the first all electronic options exchange, being on the founding team there, uh, when the rule about disclosure was created, there is a rule now that every quarter, every brokerage house has to file, I forget if it's a 660 or 606 form, but the thing is not transparent and it's somewhat opaque. And what that form shows is this is essentially the the wholesalers or the out order routers we sent our order routing to. And these are the typical forms of payment or com compensation we may have received. The, the problem with reporting it quarterly and reporting it in the aggregate, to, to your point, Mark, is it's still somewhat opaque. Uh, payment's a big part of this industry. Uh, it's a big part of the stock industry. Um, we're not going to solve the issue of like it, don't like it uh, on this call, but I think transparency is everything. And, and as I say, having worked most of my career at the two of the biggest options exchanges, one of the things that was foremost was transparency. And the lack of transparency is troubling. So number one, I think Walt's comments don't go far enough. But here's the other side to it. It's going to be a hard thing to do on a ticket-by-ticket ticket basis and and still deliver the information on a, on a timely basis. But I, I think that's something the industry should shoot for. In the early days of Options Express, when, when we started the ISC, one of the first firms to embrace us was Options Express because they had an all-electronic uh, – customer-driven, customer-centric model. And if you think about this, when I left the CBO in 2000 to go to the ISC, if you wanted to trade an option contract at Charles Schwab, it was $29.95 at two fifty dollars a contract. Now, I, I know customers are grabbing their chest right now going, what? $29.95 at two fifty dollars uh, a contract. 20 years before when I worked at Merrill Lynch, it was 14 to $15. A contract, and I know people are going to listen to this and say, "No, no, no, he's talking about a hundred lot." No, I'm not. I'm talking about a contract. What payment did is it kind of democratized the process, and, and it took the franchise away from some of the market makers. And what you had now is you had multiple exchanges, you had participation in the bid ask spread. That's essentially what payment was. You had the NMS system, which is still controversial. Um, you had NBBO and you had linkage. And all those were good, but, but there were some unwanted side effects. And some of the un unwanted side effects are what are being talked about in, in high frequency trading now. So transparency would be great. Uh, I think customers are entitled to transparency transparency, and I think it brings a lot to the table, much more than the quarterly filing now, which is reasonably opaque. Yeah, all the people who were up in arms post-Flash Boys, that's one of the things that really surprised me the most, is that people seem to be surprised by this information. We, of course, have seen it for decades in the options and equity space, so we're kind of used to it here. We're kind of uh, inside baseball here on the show. We know this kind of stuff, but to a lot of the populace, the notion that their order was being quote-unquote sold 
was was terrifying and outrageous to them. And them having any sort of insight into this, I think, would be a great step towards calming those people down and saying, here's exactly what went on with your order. Here's exactly what happened with the transaction. Here's how the execution was done. And you're right, it probably would be difficult to break it down on a per-ticket basis because a lot of these deals are done in aggregate, so maybe they have to be an estimated cost put on there, whatever the case may be. But even an estimated cost would go a long way towards clarifying a lot of that for the people who are still up in arms. And then they, they could see it demonstrably right in front of them. Here's the costs. Here's the benefits. And and they could make that informed decision if they want to route somewhere else or do something else like that or, or change firms or whatever the case may be. Now they have the data in front of them. At the end of the day, it's empowering to the end user. And also, hopefully, it'll stop some of this furor post-flash boys that the markets are rigged and all the other nonsense that we've been hearing quite a bit. Yeah. Typical payment today at, at this firm is around $0.28 cents a contract. And, and I, 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 again... Walt wants transparency, but keep in mind, there are a lot of things that don't get payment. Uh, SPX, VIX, you actually pay to trade those. Um, uh, there are a lot of firms that bundle exchange fees in. Uh, we don't do that. I get the question all the time, you know, from, from somebody somewhere, how cheap can you trade? You can trade cheap if you bundle in the, the rebates uh, I'm sorry if you if you bring out the rebates and exchange fees. Um, there are lots of firms on the street that have people trading at 50 and 60 cents a contract and limiting what they can do in the monopoly products in the SPX and, and the VIX where there are no rebates and, and there are fees. I'm a firm believer that in 2000 when the ISC was started. One of the biggest mistakes the, the, the SIBO made, and every time I talk about the SIBO, I, I do in fact get feedback, but I think one of the biggest mistakes that the SIBO made was to eliminate exchange fees, was to make trading free. And I think if the exchanges had that one to go back and do over, uh, they would. And since it wouldn't be the express block, this has all been very cheerful, Alex. We need to throw a little cold water on some of our listeners here as well. It wouldn't be the express block if we didn't do a little bit of that as well. And I know there were some interesting developments. We were talking earlier in the show about people trading VXX on this show, perhaps uh, rightfully or wrongfully. But there have been some interesting developments out there with some of these VIX ETPs, in particular from a margin perspective. Why don't you walk us through those developments really quick and how they may impact some of the listeners of this show who like to trade those products? So FINRA last week released a list of ETNs, exchange-traded notes, and they aren't just the volatility products, although uh, many people are focusing on the volatility products. It's also products like the OIL, the, the, the oil ETN. Difference between exchange-traded notes and exchange-traded funds. Exchange-traded funds are exchange-listed products that actually hold a trust of the underlying instruments. Notes are obligations of the issuer. And what FINRA has said is exchange-traded notes and the derivatives on exchange-traded notes will no longer be subject to customer portfolio margin, which means they're going to have to be margined at 100%. Now, keep in mind, this isn't commentary on are they good or bad investments, because everybody I've talked to today is taking it as commentary on uh, I shouldn't trade those for some reason. That's not what they're saying. They're saying the way ETNs are structured, extending credit on them is something that FINRA thinks is inappropriate. And as soon as FINRA thinks it's inappropriate, OCC says it's inappropriate. It goes into the, the portfolio margin calculation. This will be phased in over the next 10 days. Uh, some of the instruments it will impact today, the volatility instruments and 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 oil are uh, eight or ten days down the road. But let me emphasize again, this this isn't commentary on the, are they good or bad investments. It's more commentary on the ETN structure, and ETNs will no longer be eligible to trade in portfolio margin account. If I had more time, and, and of course as soon as I say that, they also talked about some of the futures that are used in portfolio margining. And I know last week we talked about interesting questions from social. And one of the questions that comes up all the time, 
are can futures be covered by SIPC? And of course, everybody says, no, can't be done, impossible. It's not true. A futures contract identified as part of a portfolio margin hedge is covered by SIPC. However, uh, FINRA killed most of those today. Uh, they didn't kill the SPX or the NASDAQ or the Russell. They killed some of the more arcane indexes, things like the XAU. Um, if you have questions, go to FINRA or OCC site or call us here, talk to the trading desk. If you're not a customer here, you should be a customer here. Talk to your broker. All right, good stuff, Alex. It wouldn't be an express block if we didn't throw some cold water on some product or other. So there we go, listeners. <laughs> if you're planning on trading those, may want to take a second look at how they're impacting the margin and the available capital in your account. All right, and now it's time for us to keep on rolling into our final segment, Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody, welcome to Around the Block. This is the final segment on the show and the portion of the show where we tell you what we're watching, what we're keeping an eye on on our trading screens for the coming week. Of course, some data coming down the pike. A lot of you still pay attention to what's going on. In the housing market, got two pieces of the data coming down on that front this week. Of course, the National Association of Realtors coming out with their April existing home sales. That's on Thursday. And then the Census Bureau comes out with their new home sales on newly constructed homes, excuse me, numbers on Friday. Of course, those watching the Fed, the old FOMCA meeting notes coming out on Wednesday. Of course, everyone still watching the 10 year, that yield dropping below that very, very precious two and a half level, making a lot of headlines over the past week or so. We'll keep an eye on that to see. If that still rings true in the coming week, and of course, there still are a few, a few earnings on the horizon, including if you're in the construction side of the fence, and I'm guessing if you're watching the home builders, you might be, then Home Depot and Lowe's both reporting this week. Campbell Soup, an old stalwart there, as well as one of the final tech names, Hewlett Packard, reporting as well. So a lot of names coming down, a lot of data coming down this week for you guys uh, to digest at your leisure. Senior G, Senior Giovinazzi. What are you watching for the rest of this week, sir? Um, watching, you know, again, watching vol, watching vol products. I mean, the earnings season, season is kind of petering out. Um, hey, Campbell Soup, baby. Until Campbell Soup reports, the season is not done. Uh, I guess so. Is that the last big one? <laughs> soup is good food, you know that? <laughs> um, and, I, and I'm mostly looking at just, you know, kind of theta positive trades, uh, We've been looking at like a lot of short gamma, long gamma type trades where, you know, trying to take advantage of what we think the ball is cheap in one place and expensive in another. Um, it, it, as far as what part of the market, I'm interesting to see if the Russell volatility can start to come down a little bit. I mean, we got a two day rally here. So the RBX has dropped, it's, you know, it's slowing down, but it's still been pretty woolly. Uh, I think there will be some opportunity in that thing once it settles down because um, the vol has a ways to go. So, you know, just basically looking at trying to be selective where we can sell some implied volatility. Um, but understanding full well that the VIX is at a very, very low level, so you don't sell a whole lot of it, and you try to keep the duration short. What's the fun of being selective? You see a bid, you hit it. Where have you been all these years, sir? Uh, well, that, that used to be the old, the old Andrew just used to do that. Now I'm... I'm older and more mature, and I'm more selective in the bids that I hit. <laughs> All right. I just don't hit on anything. <laughs> yes, there you go. There you go. <laughs> we'll leave that, leave that lying right there and keep on rolling. Mr. Alex, take us home, sir. What are you watching for the rest of this week? Uh, the bond pairs have gotten decimated, and I'm now in the camp that uh, we're going to stay at this level, and rates may even go lower. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of people I respect. Uh, talking about uh, seeing the 10-year back maybe under 240 and maybe in the two and a quarter area, something I wouldn't have bet on a year ago. Uh, volatility going lower. Um, I look at the 10 years a lot, and the, the sovereigns are just, they're crumbling. I mean, the Japanese 10-year is now under 06 and uh, I have hedge fund friends who tell me they think it's going to the 0.4 level. So 
I'm amazed. Um, it's macro stuff. Geopolitical has become irrelevant. Crimea didn't turn into what anyone had expected. Um, we'll start to see what comes out of Washington, uh, but they're going to go away for the summer, so they, they uh, will be able to do less damage than usual. Um, looking at 10-year rates, looking at VIX, I think they're both going lower. I think the S&P will be setting new highs in the next few weeks and months. All right, and that's going to do it for the Around the Block segment. It's also going to do it for this episode of the Option Block. But before we go, as always, let me check in with each of my cohorts, my partners in crime, to see what they have cooking, what's coming down the pike from them that may interest you, uh, the listener. He couldn't make it on the show today, but be sure to check out our friends over there at RCM and all of their various endeavors, RCM Wealth Advisors, RCM Futures, you name the asset class, uh, they have something over there. Check out the old RCM main website and then click on the subcategory that interests you the most. They have a lot of good stuff there, including all those webinars that Uncle Mike is talking about, always archived and available for you up there at rcm.com. All right, and take it away, Mr. Alex, Mr. Viceroy, what's coming down the pike over there at OX Education? So one live event left in the month of May, May 31st, Saturday. Jimmy Ruzan and his crew will be live in Philadelphia. Uh, if you don't want to make it to the live event or you can't make it to Philadelphia, all the live events are now done in a virtual form uh, on the website, optionsexpress.com, and you can uh, sit home with your slippers and cavalier on your lap and enjoy the event and participate fully. Uh, Wednesday, three three webinars I'll talk about Wednesday. By the way, Wednesday is also VIX expiration for those of you who will hear this tomorrow, if it's still during market hours. I know every time there's a VIX expiration, somebody gets the date wrong. But three webinars tomorrow, Wednesday uh, on Wednesday, uh, Nina will be doing a platform and site tour. Mike Zaremski will will be doing his new customer event for futures traders. And I just want to point out, if you're my age, the CME has relisted the cash butter product. And I know as soon as I say that, someone's going to say cash butter. Who cares, who cares about cash butter? Cash butter and uh, class three milk began trading electronically at the CME again. Uh, when I started in this business, that was known as the butter and egg exchange. Uh, uh, also, Wednesday, Nina will do protective puts and how they can be applied in an IRA account. Um, all the education is free. Just come to optionsexpress.com and click on the education tab. All right. And on behalf of the Viceroy and the Rock Lobster and even Uncle Mike, who couldn't make it today, and of course myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the program and for sending in such great questions. Keep them coming. We, of course, will answer those in the next episode. And we'll see you next time right here on The Option Block. The Option Block was brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Don't spend time worrying about your broker at Options Express by Charles Schwab. Security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit www.optionsexpress.com to open your free account. Options Express by Charles Schwab is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.